Hi, Donna. Hi, Jay. How are you? Thanks for coming down. Thank you for having me. Donna Blanchard of Kumu Kahua Theater, one of my favorite theater companies in the world. Oh. It's right next door. And I don't know if you know this, but that used to be the district courthouse building. Do you know that? I didn't. I thought it was the post office. It was the post office uh, in the early 20th century. And then I think it was nothing much until I got here and I started practicing in the, what, late 60s? <clears throat> and it was the district court. They made it the district court. It was oh. a weird thing with little um, uh, sc school desks like from elementary school. <laughs> and that's, we, the lawyers sat in these little school desks with a little table in front of it, you know, a little oh, yeah. writing place, you know. And uh, things happened. Uh, people went to jail. Uh, they, got, they got awards. It was a regular courthouse. There were two courtrooms. Yeah, yeah. I had no idea yeah, in yeah, our yeah, theater. Yeah. You know, there's always been a very close tie between the theater and lawyers. And the courts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they go together somehow. <laughs> well, I want to I want to learn more about Kumu Kuhua because uh, you know the plays I've seen there have been really thoroughly enjoyable. One I remember was really over the top. It was uh, the, the people you meet in Longs. Remember that one? I just loved that one. That was so great. It was it was local shtick. You know, yeah. What it was. Yeah. So uh, tell me, your role is executive director. I'm managing director. Manage, managing director. Yeah. What would you rather be, executive or managing? I, uh, I I like the I like the executive has a nice sound to it, but we're just a party of three at the moment. We have three full time employees. Okay, great. And 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 what do those three people do? What do you do? Um, as managing director, I am I'm in charge of the office, so the box office, make mm -hmm. sure everything runs smoothly well, the there. Big we money. have a, yeah. yeah, we have an office manager that uh -huh. uh, I work with, um, and then I'm primarily focused on fundraising and marketing. I work very closely with Harry Wong, he's our artistic director, to make sure that the programs that we are bringing in are serving the community and bringing the community to our door and then involving the community as well. And your background that makes you want to do this, uh, <laughs> makes you good at it, what is your background? Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in acting from the Professional Actors Training Program of Wright State and University. And you have been in active. Oh, where, what again? Wright State. Okay. Wright State University. Uh, I started off as an actor, uh, eventually started working in the real world, as we like to say, but I never lost my ties to the theater. I would do shows on the side whenever I could. I was in Chicago for 10 years working every little thing, teaching and being, I was on the board of a theater at the same time I had a regular day job. And then eventually the theater um, uh, for whom I served on the board asked if I could become their managing director. You have very big eyes. Oh, do I? Did anybody tell you that? Oh, I mean, I know. I mean, there's people with big eyes. Really, their eyes aren't really that big. It's just that they're very expressive. Oh, it must be the actor thing. That's what it is. That's my <laughs> professional training coming across. So, so I had a, a love, an understanding of what we do, and a, and a love for it. And I worked with a theater in Valparaiso, Indiana, that focused on some very risky, sort of edgy work. And I love that about theater, but I've always, even since I was in college, thought that theater should, I wanted to be involved in theater that could do more in our lives somehow. What, what, is, what is more in I our wasn't lives, sure, you know, and I looked into art therapy, and I, I was searching for um, ways that I could make it more meaningful in my life. and. About five years ago, I read a book by a woman named Jo Carson who did work in community uh, story theater. She would go into different communities and gather their stories and write a play from it and then be a part of the process of producing those plays with members of the community, for members of the community, using the community stories. And that work is huge for, the, for those communities. It, it brings in tourism. It uh, has a tendency to revitalize whatever area it is in. It has a tendency to sometimes heal old wounds, depending on the stories that are being used. So I fell in love with that sort of work, but I didn't, the, I, I searched for a brick and mortar theater that did only that, and I couldn't find it. I found a lot of theaters that do a little bit here and there. I found uh, volunteer community groups where there was no theater who would do this sort of work in a gymnasium once a year. Um, but at the same time I was searching and literally high and low, I was all across the country looking for it, 
Um, a, a friend of mine said, there's a theater in Honolulu I want to tell you about, and I want to give them your resume, can I? You came out here for Kumu Kahua. Yeah. That is splendid. I know, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, had never, I had never been here before. I'd heard it was nice. <laughs> um, and they needed me. I had experience with helping a theater that had been in financial uh, distress in the past. So I, um, I was a good choice for them, and they were the choice for me. Interesting. And, and that was because you had freedom to do what you wanted to do. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Actually, when I was searching for the theater, um, and I'm, uh, I don't have children of my own. I'm, uh, I'm in between marriages at the moment, <laughs> let's say. Uh, I w was looking high and low, and I finally said, and, and this is a true story, um, the, the woman that I talked about, Joe. I, she had cancer and was dying, and I went to visit her one last time, and she told me that I needed to keep going with this work and make sure that I did it. And um, after that visit with her, I said, I will go anywhere to do this work. And it was two weeks later that I heard from Kumu Kahua, and I said, well... There's a message. I put it out there. I'm going to do it. And I've been here a little over a year, working with this amazing theater that the, the work... There, there are shows like Folks You Meet in Longs that are just embraceable, let's say. Uh, there are other shows that we do that are still embraced by the community, some stories that are difficult. Uh, it, it's part of our mission to develop playwrights. Um, so, And some of the work that we do is still in development and it's embraced by all of our artists as well as the community. What are you doing right now? We're doing a show called All That Remains which is the, it, it's about a young man searching for answers to what happened to his father. He was in the 442nd. Locally written? Who wrote it? It was written by a woman in New York, of all places, in collaboration with a friend of hers in L.A. But this, uh, the playwright Mona Z. Smith had um, been in France and came across a monument to the, a, a battle that occurred there um, with the 442nd and 100th Battalions. And, that, was, and that was how she learned of it? That's how she learned of it. She had two uncles who were in the war, but they had no ties to Hawaii at all. Mm -hmm. What she had um, a, a passion for was the idea of um, people fighting a, a, a across um, familial battle lines. and, and um, the complications that come with war. So she was, that started the idea. Um, she and her friend collaborated on the background of it. She was a, a journalist first, I should mention that. So she could so do she research. So she had a hunger, yeah. yeah. She had a hunger, and before there was the internet, she, she knew how to do the research. Yeah. <laughs> we well, was there research Wikipedia. before the internet? <laughs> yeah, there, were, there was libraries, there was travel. Um, so it's very odd that the, the show we did right before this, um, A Cage of Fireflies, was about three Okinawan women finding their way, and they were Kibe, of the Kibe tradition, finding their way in Honolulu. And it was written by a young man who has uh, o some Okinawan heritage. That makes sense, right? This woman is, I, I don't know Mona's cultural makeup, but she looks Scandinavian, <laughs> you know, and she's here writing about. Well, she finds universality the in the story. And that's the thing. That's the thing about the stories is they are, if they're human stories, they are universal. Yeah. And there is just one race. So it unites yeah. all of us. My, my uh, goal is that for these stories, our stories, to travel and so uh, to r make the distance across the ocean a little smaller. Let me, let me tell you two references that come to mind from what you say. Uh, one is The Descendants, the movie. Mm. Okay. And it's a Hawaii story. Uh, it's a story that people in Hawaii, a lot of people in Hawaii know that story, you know, or elements of that story. Uh, you, you know, it's a sort of patchwork, but you know the whole, whole story. Uh, but the people on the mainland don't know the story. The people outside of Hawaii don't really know the story that ascended. So that's one of the reasons it was so successful. It was like um, storytelling arbitrage. You know, it, it exists here, it doesn't exist there, so we export it and, and they like it. So, but that's only one of a thousand, a million stories that we have here. All that diversity, all those really interesting things that happen, sometimes painful things that happen in the transition of people from Asia especially to Hawaii, their settlement here, you know, the building of the state. All these really incredible things that happened around statehood, you know. This is great stuff. 
we haven't even begun telling that. Right. And you can do it, actually. Yeah, we can. And we can bring it down to the humanity of the story. How would you feel if? And once you look at that, oh, I would feel that way. And then you, then you have to recognize a kinship with those individuals. And it's hard to hate someone when you understand them, right? Well, you'll have to work harder at it. <laughs> hate, hate, hate isn't going away it's anytime possible. soon. It's <laughs> possible. And, and I, yeah, I don't think there's, there's, I think there's lack of understanding. You know, I grew up in the Midwest, just outside of Chicago, and I didn't know what was happening here in Hawaii. Uh, up till I moved here, I pretty much thought I was moving to another state. I didn't realize the background that go, that went into it. And I have some Native American heritage that I can, I can sympathize to a certain extent, but until you really know, you don't know. Yeah. The other reference that comes to mind is a, is a play, which you probably haven't heard of, which is being promoted to investors right now, um, called Allegiance. Allegiance is uh, with Leah Salonga and um, um, uh, the guy who played Zulu, I think, in, in Star, Star Trek. George Takei. George Takei. George, George, George Takei. And a uh, great, great cast. And it's a musical, okay? <laughs> yeah, I have heard and about that. And it's about the internment camps, you know. And it, it hopes that it opened in San Diego last year and was successful as a test, test model. Mm -hmm. uh, and they hope to open it this year uh, in New York on Broadway. And uh, there's a movie of it, of the San Diego performance. And it was really terrific. It was a spine tingler and a tearjerker mm -hmm. over and over again. What, what I, the, I raise it because it was a musical. You take a difficult subject like that and you make a musical? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is new. Uh, then recently there's one called Next to Normal, playing at the mm -hmm. uh, Manoa Theater yeah. about mental illness. And this is also a, a musical. musical. What's going on here? It, it sounds like a couple of things. One is. We are in a renaissance about local performing arts. Two is um, we take difficult subjects and we handle them. So what's your perception of all of that? You know, I think that the theater is one of the safest places in the world to approach really difficult material. And I remember learning that um, uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber was doing a musical of Phantom of the Opera, and I said, that's crazy. <laughs> look what happened. You're going to take that macabre <laughs> story and you're going to do that with it. And look what look at Les Miserables. You yeah, know. same thing. Um, and when you're in the theater, it's, it's unlike a movie in that you are, you, you are engaged in a different way. You're breathing with the artists. You, you, you are more than just in the room uh, observing something. How does that work? You're relating. How, to how, how are you relating? I, mean, I always thought that radio, even this radio, is a breathing experience because mm -hmm. you never really connect with people unless you can hear them breathe. Right. You, you, you sort of you, you, you find the, the rhythm, the rhythm of their life in their breathing. Um, but why do you say that happens in a theater? You're, because you're so intimately. If it's cold in the room, you're all cold together, and you're acutely. You have to sus suspending your disbelief in a theater is far different when. You know, when we have an oceanfront scene or we have a mountaintop scene, you know you're not really there. So you're sus you, that willing you're suspension. You're asked to go the of, extra step. Yeah, you're playing along, right? Yeah. Uh, and when you do that, when you do that in the theater, you you are engaged more fully. Yet you're still safe. We are not. Nothing is going to hurt you, right? So we can. Um, we can be in the bowels of wherever the Phantom of the Opera was. <laughs> we can be, be in the bowels of the Opera House, or we can be I in France during the Revolution, and you're not going to be harmed. Then you add music to it, and we don't do a lot of musicals at Kumukuhua Theater, but it, it, t it, it takes the same sort of leap in that it, um, it adds that dimension where life doesn't normally proceed through musical cues. <laughs> <laughs> but you buy into it and it touches you in a different way. The same way it touches you in a different way when you, uh, when you see a comedy about something that's difficult, laughter through tears, touches you in a different way that you take with you. And I believe, and I know Harry, our artistic director, believes that the import of the show is not 
what happens before the curtain goes down. It's what happens after the curtain goes down. It's what you take with you when yeah. you leave. Isn't it that the truth? Yeah. Yeah. And The Descendants is an excellent example of, man, that was real, and you get someone like George Clooney involved in it. So you, you have a built-in audience who previously neither knew nor had any reason to care about the experience of, uh, of people here. And that, that was a beautiful, that was a beautiful film. I saw that on my way here. I saw it oh, four days before what a great I entry. here. Yeah. Yeah. And I was told, go see that film. Yeah. Don't see From Here to Eternity. That's not going to no, That's not gonna give you now. any yeah. kind of experience, yeah. but The Descendants is real. And yeah. you feel like, you know, those well, are all. Do you agree with me about the renaissance of uh, performing arts here? I mean, I, we've had theater. We've had theater at Ruger, I mean, Diamond Head. Mm -hmm. We've had theater uh, at, uh, certainly, at Kumukuhua. Um, we've had theater at, um, uh, actually, there was, there was a live, there's live theater on the military bases. I don't know if you have any connection yeah, with right? that. There uh, used to be, but yeah, it's I don't know it if ended. it's still happening, but, yeah, but there were ended. a lot of people who cared about it, at least at one point in time. And, and uh, I don't think it was ever as vital as it is now. I, I, I'm not sure why, because we have, you know, right now the fall of the arts, the symphony is pretty much gone, the opera is at risk, and the opera, grand, Performing arts, the grandest of all. Um, so why isn't the theater under the same kind of pressure? It seems to be doing well. Well, uh, I know that. It, and by the way, I saw Next to Normal. That that was an awesome show. There's some great work going on at TAG. There's some really risky work going on that I think theater can do on a different budget scale than right. than film. You don't can have to have do. a fancy, fancy platform. Right, and the. Um, the, the largest growth sector within theater is those things that engage audience. We can, we can do that. So um, having a talk story after a performance is something that we do. Having classes that we can offer our patrons, that is the 82% uh, over the last five years was the, the growth of that segment. That's really unique, and I think that's exactly what you're talking about with the, the renaissance of theater, that people are coming out of their homes and getting more engaged. We have a lot to keep us in, the, in a box, and theater is an opportunity to really be part of a community. Intermission. I, someone should do a study on intermissions and what happens, because you were sitting next to a stranger you know, an hour ago when you walked into the theater, and then you have experienced you experienced something together. You know, you're 500 feet from this studio, and I want to tell you that in, when we do our luncheon programs up at the uh, Plaza Club upstairs, we always do exit interviews on tape. We walk around with a cameraman and we put a microphone up and um, people, we ask them, so what do you think? Are you enjoying it? And um, they answer us, and then we make this kind of medley of, of clips about what they said, and it's really fun to listen. So sometime, I'm happy to do this, we'll bring a camera over during your intermission or maybe after or both oh, and we'll take, take clips from what people have to say. You can use that on your website. <laughs> I would love that. That would be, that would be marvelous. And it, like the show that we have going on now is some tough subject matter and it's, I love to be at the door when people leave the theater to say goodnight to them and see the looks on their faces yeah. and talk to them about what they've just yeah. witnessed. Yeah. And, yeah, that would be that would be well, wonderful I, to do. I, I think live theater, you know, and, I, and frankly, I, I I don't like what's happened to uh, uh, Blaisdell Center in terms of these shows, uh, the road shows that come from hither and yon and cost a hundred dollars a seat and don't offer anything on a local level, but everybody brings their kids and spends their last disposable income on tickets at a hundred dollars a seat for the whole family in the name of some kind of ersatz visit to Broadway. <laughs> uh, I'd rather go see you guys. I'd rather, I'd rather have that, uh, you know, close up personal experience. But what, what do you think about that? I mean, is that, can we say that's part of the Renaissance or can we say it's pulling the other way? Where does it fit? Why well, that's a, that I, I think that, I don't think that it's pulling the other way. I think that it's part of the Renaissance, um, that institution, the, the big show that's going on at the Blaisdell, you know, going to see the Nutcracker, something like that. There is tradition, and if that's the, a, a child's first entree to theater, then so be it. That's beautiful to, to have that tradition. We and some of the other theaters on the island are more about um, 
a week, at least an experience that you can have a couple of times a month without breaking the bank, something that you can get involved in. There's also an intellectual process there that you're offering, an engagement that the, you know, the big slick production really doesn't. I mean, it's more like eye candy than oh, yeah. it is mind candy, I think. We, uh, we actually, we have the lowest prices on the island for our shows, and not only do we plan to keep it that way, it's my goal to find the sponsorship so that we can drop our prices. Oh, that's great. I don't want anyone to not come to the theater. That's great. For any reason, let alone price, if we can have anything to do Thought with it. Thought of another one, the, uh, the uh, Honolulu Theater for Youth. Oh, yeah. Which is really a very vital organization. The kids love it. I'd like to take clips over there too. <laughs> oh yeah, that would be. You know? Oh gosh, yes. Get and those the kids, kids take away such show. different things than what you could ever expect they would take away. They oh, see yeah. it completely differently than you and me. <laughs> oh yeah, to see one of their shows and then see the clips of the kids would yeah. be yeah. a wonderful experience to have. But what I what I get though, uh, and I'm I'm really sort of asking. Uh, I'll tell you my reaction. See if you agree. What I get is that, is this renaissance has another side to it. It has the side of uh, maybe theater in general now has. It's that edgy theater you're talking about. Has the, has the possibility of dealing with public policy issues, dealing with issues uh, about things in our society that may be off the track, about things that are hard because we haven't been towing them. We haven't been, we haven't been engaging with government, with, with the society around us, and the, and the play reminds us of that. The play uh, you know, reports a problem. The play tries to get us engaged in the way maybe we weren't before. Mm. So it's a political message sometimes. And, you know, you, you talked about the, the personal quality of being there and sharing the stage, the experience. Um, that's got to be at least as powerful as any other media mm. in terms of reaching people and how they think. You know? Absolutely. And it's the how they think. I think that's the key to it is experiencing... Uh, we did a show, Kamau'a'e, last summer that was about the Hawaiian sovereignty movement, a young man who, w within the family, there was someone who was working in the hotel on the family fishing grounds and another who was fighting the hotel on the family Perfect. fishing grounds. And the thought processes that, and the, re the interrelational communication that goes into that and you know, there's so little that is black and white, right and wrong. It's just how you deal with things that matters. And I wouldn't make those same choices necessarily as the person I'm seeing on stage, but now I at least have had an opportunity to feel it, to, to experience it on some level. And, you know, in the day, the, the interactivity that we have, those, those opportunities, um, Facebook and Twitter, that we use that communication as much as possible. But that will never be as immediate as a theater experience, right? And the conversation that comes after right. it, and the um, the growth that we experience as a community as a result of having a, a local downtown theater. Another thought. Uh, this is slightly at random, but hey, we're just having a conversation. <laughs> Give it to me. <laughs> well, if I go to the theater once every five years, I may not be the most. Um, you know, the most trained, the most sensitive theater goer. I'm not, I'm not seeing it necessarily in all the panoply. I'm, I, may be, I may be giving it a shallow break that way. But if I go once a month or twice a month and I become more astute in what I am seeing and what I am interpreting uh, and the, the quality of the, the message and the acting and everything that you're producing, so I'm going to get more the average person. I'm going to get more out of a show if I have been to the theater regularly. Mm -hmm. Am I right about that? It's an educational process. I think huh? so. Yeah, not that there's there's a lot in it for the person who goes once every five years, but the same way, if you're going to go, if you're going to go see a symphony perform Verdi's Requiem, the more familiar familiar you are with Verdi's Requiem, the more you're going to enjoy when you are actually there to witness it. And the more opportunities you have to go to a theater, every theater. I mean, there's high school theater. There's some really good stuff going on at Midpack, and you know the college theater. Yeah, the that feeder we have for here. you. Yeah, and we're out there. <laughs> we're recruiting talent scouts. We, we not only need your actors, we need your playwrights too, <laughs> please, and your audience. Yeah. Um, the, but the more involved you are in witnessing that part of the process, that that then you become a part of the process as a patron. Yeah. 
a patron, yeah, a patron. Well, you know, I hope that we have a lot of patrons around. I, uh, I think we lost, for one reason or another, then there was probably a lesson in all this, we lost a number of patrons for the symphony. Mm -hmm. they, they stopped supporting it for one reason or another, or they stopped supporting it at the levels that were necessary. Uh, the opera, you know, I think one of their problems is that they, they no longer have a defined season. They're all over the, the calendar, and this, mm -hmm. this has a negative effect. Uh, for for theater, especially may I say, off Bishop Street <laughs> type theater that you're doing, um, you I can like that. you can control <laughs> the calendar, and you can control for that matter. You can control the subjects. You can control the quality. Uh, you are the executive producer, I think, of what's happening in that theater. So you can have a lot to say about it, and you can get it up to a standard. And maybe this is going to train a whole generation of kids hopefully, uh, it back back into the arts, you know, and from this comes maybe uh, an appetite for other things. You know. Hopefully. I, I will just say rather than back to the arts, forward into something new. That's really what... I want to talk to you about that. Because <laughs> really what we are about is uh, our theater is not a stuffy place. You come in and you rub a slippers, <laughs> we say. Um, we are looking for playwrights. We have playwriting classes and workshops, and we are, you can come to our auditions. I have, I have somebody who is perfect, I'm going to introduce you to him, oh, okay, good. Who, who writes already. Uh, a young college kid, but he's very good and he's very sensitive about oh, that. Fabulous. Anybody can do it, right? Anybody, any, not, every, not anybody can do it well. Anybody can do it. Yeah, anybody can come in yeah, and take the classes. Some people find out they do it well after they do it. Yeah. Right, right. This is true. <laughs> well, you know, we just had a workshop with high school students two weeks ago at the theater, and they worked with us for one day, and they had to come up with a piece, and most of these were five, ten minutes long, um, that involved dramatic irony. And these were, some of them were really good. We just showcased them last Friday night before our regular performance because they were so surprisingly good. Now, Kumukuhu is a theater where we will take the risks and we will produce your work knowing that it's not necessarily done. We're going to take those risks. And that's what we want people to come to, come and support that, because thereby we are growing an entirely new generation sure, of artists sure. and appreciators of art. A, a collaborative thing, you know. Mm -hmm. It's part of, I, um, not to jump neighborhoods, but it's part of what's going on in Kaka'ako, you know is, uh, for example, uh, it's not the same art, but there are these uh, wall murals down there. Yeah. And Kamehameha Schools and other, other property owners down there have agreed that these kids can paint the walls. And somehow that's been a lightning rod. So they come from all over to paint the walls, and then they believe that it's theirs. There's a proprietary connection now. And they believe that neighborhood is where, you know, the seminal neighborhood for the new generation and it's actually happening, believe it or not. Now, there's no, there's no guarantee it's going to continue to happen for one day more. But right now, today, it's happening. Yeah. And so it's the same thing. It's a proprietary interest. If these kids feel that they can participate in whatever process you're offering, they, they're part of it. They will engage to their emotional souls. Absolutely. And then you, you will be doing what we call in Yiddish a mitzvah. Do they, do they talk about that in Indiana? <laughs> I was pretty close to Chicago. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, the it's interesting. You talk about the murals. I um, had a friend visiting from uh, from the Midwest, and I was showing her around Kaka'ako and all of those murals. It's not graf it's graffiti art, but they're you know they're murals. And she said, "Well, what if someone someone comes and spray paints over them?" And I said, "That ne that never happens because those belong to the community now." There's, there is a sense of ownership. There is a sense of ownership when you're telling your stories, whether it's with paint or in a poetry slam or on a stage. What's yeah. interesting, by the way, is that this year, there were some very good pieces, okay, in the last iteration, a year ago. And this year, they painted over some of them. Oh, yeah. the, the organizers of the, the program said, well, you know, we're running out of walls, so have at it. Do your, do your next thing. 
Yeah. So you have a whole new generation of art springing up every time they do oh, one of these wow. art festivals. And I, I really like that, although I miss some of the old pieces. But it's been recorded on film anyway. It's so not you lost. have it somewhere. And that makes yeah. it a more fluid art. Yeah. That's yeah, interesting. Well, yeah. huh? So the same here, you know, it's like, it's like wave after wave of new creativity. And, you know, you're the island in the stream. They're coming at mm -hmm. you. <laughs> And those kids can provide those thousand stories you're talking about. But I want to talk about the. Um, I want to talk about exactly how you do this down there. Okay? okay. First question is: Do you ever go out and ask these playwrights to write write something on an issue that you think ought to be written about? Um, n not exactly in those terms. Uh, the theater has commissioned playwrights, but does that mean pay? Yes. And in. Uh, not in as uh, they haven't been directed is would you write something about the Hawaiian sovereignty movement the question is we already know this playwright we already know Alani Apio and we already know you wrote one piece we'd like to commission you to write the second piece uh, uh, about so that. it's based on maybe in part based on what he's already done or she's already done yeah or at least uh, knowing that person what they're passionate about right right and, and so there's sort of there's a little proof there there's a little proof of concept already yeah yeah so, um, and the kinds of topics are local topics that you're getting in? Yeah, for the most part. They're, they're local or they are d dealing with a um, community that is local. Our, the next show that we have after this is um, uh, David Henry Huang piece, uh, Sound and Beauty. It's two of his one acts that deal with uh, specifically j the Japanese community. And he's not a local playwright. No, he's not. Yeah, this will be interesting to take it to another level. Yeah, you know. yeah, to bring his work here. We have a very large Japanese population, and these are Japanese myth pieces that are going to speak very loudly to them and should to everyone who lives around them. You know, these are our people. This is, these are Hawaii's people. Do you get, do you get written up uh, in the press lo locally? We do get some really good coverage from the press, yeah. I must say. Who, is, who especially? Uh, well, we have a wonderful relationship with the Star Advertiser and Honolulu Weekly, but all the way to MyPearlCity.com. All right. Get some very uh, nice okay. coverage. Chinatown newspaper, they're doing some really wonderful things. Yeah. Uh, we, we, the press really embraces us. We're That's great. Really blessed by that. What about the mainland press? Did they come around too? Uh, my hometown <laughs> did when I moved of here. Of course. It was a big story. <laughs> uh, we did, AAA Magazine did a big story on us. Uh, they actually followed the um, uh, the director of the show that we did during the holidays, Fishing for Wives, um, an Ed Sakamoto piece. Uh, they followed the director, who is the artistic director of the theater as well, throughout the entire process of um, um, uh, selecting the play all the way through the closing of the show. So that was nice. That's Other than that, we don't get a whole lot of coverage. Yeah. I hope that we do. But you know, we, uh, we're talking about potentially working with some other theaters on the mainland to share what we do with them. Some of those theaters that I talked about. S sister city kind of thing. Yeah. Well, yeah, and groups that do community story work. Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be lovely to see some of the Inuit work from Alaska done here and we can take our yeah, shows there? Yeah, that's a great idea. And I have some connections to Chicago theaters and Harry spent, had um, worked through a fellowship with the Arena Theater in Washington, D.C. We can, you know, share our work. And I would, oh, there's another fellow I was just talking to who's in Santa Fe, New Mexico. There's some stories that I'd, I'd like to have those stories here because we'll watch them together and we'll say, oh, I know how that feels. I didn't know I had a, any connection to Native Americans in New Mexico, but I really do. It's great, but there is a common denominator. When you talk local, local is local everywhere. Right. It's just a different kind of local, that's all. That's <laughs> right. That's right. That's so, our unity. So what about, what about um, tourists? Do you ever have buses of tourists come down? Do you seek that? Do you, do you want to avoid it? What? Um, we do not, we have not had the buses come and just open their door and flood us with people. We would love to have that happen. We recognize that for the first time tourist who comes here, they don't necessarily want to go sit in a dark theater <laughs> in general. We, they want the sun and the surf and they, right. uh, hula, whatnot. <laughs> yeah, not necessarily what we're doing. However, the repeat visitor and the um, part-time resident, we do have some of those people who are coming to us now. And, you know, we're a little theater. We're caught in that conundrum of 
we want to reach those people, but it costs money to reach those people. And right now, we are working our way through an economic recovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and reaching reaching tourists always access to tourists costs money. Everyone so wants the structure. them. Yeah, everyone wants <laughs> them, and the people who can deliver them to you, you know, do it for a living, that right. kind of thing. So it's not like the tourists are seeking you out. There's got to be somebody in the pipeline like that. Mm -hmm. Little uh, by little, we're finding ways to reach the people who want to go on their vacation, they want to learn more. They want that learning experience. Yeah, and, and those are the repeats, for sure. Including repeats from Asia, right? Sure. They, you know, they want to find out also. Uh, so what about the number of seats? I mean, do you have enough seats to, to, um, you know, to, to, to do what you want to do, or are you looking for another theater somewhere else, or what? Someday, no, right now we have, um, you know, our theater is a black box, so it's very flexible and the, the arrangement changes for almost every show. But oh, really? We, the platforms and all that oh, stuff? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. It's theater in the round now for this show. Okay. And the lights change and all that. Yep. We and can borrow your lights sometimes. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, we, but we always make sure we have at least 100 seats. And we do 20 performances on average of each production. And we have in the past, when we have a very popular show, sometimes we bring them back in the summer. We'll do a remount to them. So currently, the last show that we did, we sold out with 100 seats and 20 performances. We also extended a weekend, and we sold all but something crazy like 35 tickets. Everything else totally sold Why? out. Why? You know what? That show, I think that we've been seeing a snowball effect with the theater. Little by little, we're seeing more and more people coming in as... This is a theater that went, went without a managing director for a year before I got here and, right. and had gone through some hard financial times. And one of the first things that is often cut is the marketing budget. So we're growing our audience little by little. People are hearing we're there. They're getting a consistent message. Uh, but also, the last show spoke to the Okinawan community. And I think that that might have been a group that hadn't been tapped by the theater before. and. They're very supportive and very wonderful. Actually, some of those groups who came in for that show are coming back to see, to sure. see this well, one. Every time you make a friend, you, you know, you have a repeat, at least possible. Do you have season tickets? We do. Yeah. We do. We're just um, wrapping up this season. The next show, we'll finish it, and we'll be announcing our upcoming season uh, later this month. Gee, that sounds month. like a worthy, uh, a worthy uh, uh, purchase and a worthy gift, actually. Yeah. And, and you know, I mean, I think a lot of people do this, and they should do it for you, is they buy a couple of seats extra, you know, maybe for them and two more. Yeah. And then take out their friends one by one through the season. So it's a gift. I like that. Know. We have some subscribers who do that. They'll purchase yeah. two extra. We also just this year are starting um, a, a viewer's choice pass. So instead of two tickets to this show and two tickets to that, you'll get 10 tickets, and you can and decide pick. how you want to use yeah, them through great. the year. And you can, those are easy gifts. You can give them to people who are part-time residents. What are we talking about in terms of the price of a ticket? Uh, Seventy-five dollars for seventy-five dollars for a year of our shows. That's that's five productions. Seventy-five dollars for, for our all subscriptions. Of them? Yeah. You're right. That's cheap. It's cheap. Our uh, adult uh, single ticket price is $20. But we do, and here's the, I, I love it that we do this on Thursday and Friday nights. Student tickets are only $5. Five. Do they come and fill the house? They, they come quite often. And we have some really wonderful teachers that we work with who insist that their students come. And they make it a, a part of their, a, a different way to connect to the literature that we're working with. So we talked before about uh, you know changing people's minds, how they think about social issues, community issues. What about changing their minds as to their careers? What about drawing them in to theater and, and making them theater people? Does that happen? Um, well, we ha we work I mean, with like some people. Perform. Yeah, we work with some people who. I've seen it certainly throughout my career, people who come to see the shows and they enjoy them and they get the newsletter and they see their auditions and then they end up on stage or they end up helping out building sets. And It's, it's, a, it's a continuum that where one touches the other, right? Oh, Being yeah. on stage, building the set, it's all part of the same thing, isn't it? I'll tell you what, it is. And I have been, I've been a performer all of my life and the first time I worked in a theater where the performers in the show were asked to also come in and help paint and build the set and I thought you want me to 
you want me to pick up a paintbrush? <laughs> All right, if I must. I can remember sitting out in the house during a rehearsal and looking up and saying, I painted that wall. It's, it's, it's an indescribable feeling yeah. that I, I had, I had a, a, a large part in this. It's yeah. not a small part, it's a large yeah. part. Yeah, um, yeah the, the way in which we can touch lives and we don't change minds, I like to think that we open them. And, and we do make a point at Kumukahua of not making decisions for you. We're going to lay it all out there, and you can go home and think what you think and have those conversations. And that's what we want to have happen, but we're yeah. never going to make up your mind This for is you. very, very healthy stuff. You know, it's, it's critical thinking, what you're talking about. You're, you're not only offering them, you're actually you're, you're pushing them into critical thinking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How can you go to a play that has these, you know, these adverse positions and not try to do some thinking about it right because <laughs> you're not offering them an answer if you offered them the answer they wouldn't do the critical thinking you know <laughs> right and then it's just, and there's a, there's a place for that too there's a place for going to see you know the, the show that you've seen over and over again fiddler on the roof or, or Oklahoma mm -hmm. and just relaxing and shutting yeah. off we're, we're not that theater there's, there's a place don't for do that Oklahoma theater. we're not going to do it no I don't do it. No, but really. It's enough. It's enough. We have to move forward. We have to move ahead into the point. Especially in Hawaii, we have to, we have to hit these issues. We have to recreate, you know, a, a generation that will take the reins, move ahead. You know, be proud, be creative, all that. And, and the job's not done. You're part of, the, in my view, you're part of that job. You know? I think so. So what happens when uh, they get they get the bug? What happens? Do you give them a job? Do you let them come on? I mean, how do you make your selections? I'm sure it's not based on looks. It's got to be based on a whole <laughs> combination of things. Huh? Yeah. Well, uh, first I'll say that we've just started offering um, acting classes as well. I, we've had them at the theater before. We're doing it with more regularity. You teach? Yeah, I Great. do. For um, at least quarterly, we're trying to offer something. Um, a, and, and we're not a professional theater. HTY is the, they, um, they actually have a professional company that they work with. Um, but when people come in and audition for us, we will work with them, if at all possible, and say, we're not going to cast you in the role this time, and here's why, and here's what you could work on. And, and here's a class to help you work on. Right. Sometimes it does come down to a matter of looks. I was cast in a show because the director saw me in a hallway standing next to the guy he knew he was going to cast in the show. And pretty much, boy did he luck out, but <laughs> he pretty much made the decision based on, we looked like a husband and wife. Uh -huh. And and it was a smallish role. Yeah, but so that's the way know, it works, doesn't it? Out. Sometimes it does it's come like down to thing. And when you when you select your players, you, you're looking with your, your all your feelings, all your life experience, you're sort of sucking up the persona of the individual, to try to figure out how that person going to project on the stage. It's right. not easy. Experience counts. Experience counts. Personality counts too. And uh, I like to think that we work as um, a, a, a staff, as board members, as the ensemble that make up the theater, as well as the ensembles that make up each of the shows, as true ensembles in that what you bring to the table is most important. The rest can be molded. The rest, if as long as you come in with the right heart and the right tools, we're going to be able to help you to become what you need to be in order to tell this story. Well, you know, the, you know I, I sit there and I watch uh, actors um, doing their thing and I, and I ask myself, could I ever do that? Could I ever put myself into someone else's skin uh, and em embrace a character and the dynamic of a character that I am not anything like? Maybe I should be a little like that person, but I'm not. And, <laughs> And how, you know, how do you train a young person to do that? Because it's not, it's not necessarily native, unless this person has some kind of really incredible talent or this person is, is used to, you know, wrapping himself or herself in sort of a fictitious persona. But <clears throat> how, do you, how do you make that happen? It, well, you know, it's interesting, and there are as many different theories, you know, as there are people, and there's your... There's your stock answers that come from like Uta Hagen and you know the, the the major ones, and I think we all create an amalgamation that works for us. For me, it's a matter of uh, intellectual choices, uh, the physical embodiment, uh, the manifestation of what's going on in 
in your head, and that is all based on your own experiences. You know, this is this is what I these are the choices that I am going to make because of the, this is who I am, or this is the research that I've been able to do. It's all based on who you are, right? So I play a role. I played a role five years ago. If I play it another five years from now, it's going to be different, even though I may not have gotten different training. So training you have to sort of mediate it with your own thing. Is you taking this role, this other person, this fictitious person, the, 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 the character, and you're negotiating that character with your character, mm -hmm. and, and you have to settle the matter somehow. Yeah, why are you saying these lines? Well, how can I make sense of these lines? Because I read it and I think, oh, that person's just mean. Well, n n you have to give your characters more than that. Nobody's mean for the sake of being mean. They're doing it because they believe they're doing the best that they can at any given time, and they just want what we all want. We want to be loved. We want to be safe. So you got to take those Shakespeare or Shepard or Ibsen, whoever wrote those lines, and make some intellectual choices. This is why you would say something like that. And then this is what it feels like. Ooh. And then a step further, this is what it looks like. What an experience. Well, you should come well, over. Yeah, well, I, I'll look <laughs> at it in a different way now. But, I mean, you know, that, that never struck me that um, all people are motivated by, by the same things. We're all human beings. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to relate even meanness to being a human being, when, you know. And, uh, and then uh, you've got you've to convey that even though it's hard for you. And so, I, you know, the, the question, I, I mean, how, how does an ordinary person, do you teach that? What's method acting? Is this method acting you're talking no. about? Is that something different? Oh, well, method, ac method acting is the uh, understanding, it, it, to, in a sense, yes. It, it's the understanding of how things feel. Breath, you talked about breath. It all really begins there. If I'm saying this, I'm upset. That's why I'm saying this. Well, I breathe differently when I'm upset. So you, you begin there. You begin how it feels in the body. And... Yeah, you, you can teach that. You teach it through observation. You know, notice, there, you know, the, the movie Fame, you, but when, when did that come out? In the 70s. Mm -hmm. One of the first things the kids have to do is pay attention to how they eat their cereal in the morning, how they feel when they wake up, how they feel when they brush their teeth. It does really begin there. How does it feel when... You, you go home and you talk with your spouse or your children and something upsets you and not necessarily in that moment thinking about it but recalling it later well it made my shoulders tighten up and it made my breathing became more shallow because I was angry and I got this surge of adrenaline and it made, made me flush I felt that heat and I was a little uncomfortable and on the edge all of those things we all feel them on a daily basis you don't necessarily you notice know, them if you're on the stage and you're trying to do your best, and you understand, you know, these these human foibles that that drive characters, and you know, sort of basic common denominators of humanity. Uh, first of all, you have a new view of humanity. You must, because you must learn about humanity in order to do that. Right. You must find saving grace common denominators, which is really a wonderful lesson mm -hmm. in terms of appreciating the planet and and the condition of life. Um, you got it. <laughs> that's so. So you right there. You're changing somebody. Yeah. You're, you're a young actor who you led into the ensemble. You're changing that person. You're giving that person a gift that that person will remember his whole or her whole life. But there's more though, and that is, it seems to me. Correct me if not. I'm on the stage, and I'm projecting. You know, being upset about something. So I actually, it's like I'm. Un it's like part of me is out there in the audience watching me. I'm able to see myself doing what I do. I'm able to appreciate, you know, the, the audience, the person watching, and therefore I'm at one with the audience. I'm connected and because it's an echo effect. It's a, I'm just making this up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to some extent, you, you don't want your focus to be over there has to be here but you have to follow a certain set of rules like they have to be able to hear you so you have to project you have to be speaking louder than you necessarily would in that given situation but you're I, I would say that 
you have to learn those rules so that you can forget those rules, and you, you do forget them. That one of the worst things an actor can ever do is be aware of themselves while they're actually working on the stage. And this is why we go through the rehearsal process. So you get those rules down, and then you forget it and you just feel. And I can tell you, I can, I can um, maybe demonstrate this for you. I worked, uh, there was a woman that we brought out last summer for a master class who has experience at um, the actor studio. She used to teach there in their master's program. And I did a, a demonstration with her for some film students about intent and motivation for the actor. And another actor and I read a scene together that we'd never, neither of us, she made sure it was a play we'd never read before. So we read about a 10 minute scene for the filmmakers and then we dissected it. We talked about it. Why is she saying this? Why is he doing this? What is their relationship? What happened before this moment? What is gonna happen next? We talked about it and then we read it again. And then we were given some blocking and we read through it again. And she took our scripts away. Oh, jump off the mountain. <laughs> and we did almost the entire scene, not word for word, but moment for moment was all there because we understood it. Yeah. So we learned it. So operating on an emotional level there. And, because uh, that's what it all boils down to. Yeah. If, if my line is to say to you, what time is it? Well, why am I saying it? If I'm, if I'm impatient or if I'm anxious about, you know, if once I know that, the words, what time is it, are going to come easily because I know you know, I physically, I have, co you know, cognitive dissonance. When you get your body in that uh, state of anxiety, the breathing and the feeling of the adrenaline, all of that, your, your body responds in kind. You will actually get the flush and all of these things, and the emotion is there. So the words just pop out at that point. Make yourself cry? <laughs> Um, I haven't done that in a very long time, but yeah. And you know what? I can, I can tell you that sometimes you do, uh, sometimes you depend on the emotion. I will admit right here and now that I did the show, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Great show. It was a great show. There's a very big, that's a very good example of that character. I played Martha. She says and does some really heinous things, but she only did them for all the right reasons. Yeah. So the, the big ending, there's a big scene, and you have to bawl your eyes out, yeah. really. It needs to be there. And sometimes, so it's so intense night after night. Yeah. And sometimes you feel the emotion, but the physicality of it may not be there. So I'm going to, right now, I'm going to admit a cheat. Man, this is like, this is like the magician showing you a trick, but I had um, Vicks VapoRub, you know what I'm talking about, at a certain point on the mantle of the fireplace that was on the set. So I knew that I could go there. If, if it wasn't happening for me, I knew that I could go there and no one would ever know what was happening and then I could do this and just the fumes from it would help the physicality happen. And then maybe it starts by itself because you're at the, at the brink over. of it anyway. Well, and there were nights when I left. You also have to know how to turn those things off. Right. And there, there are a lot of actors who have problems we know film actors as well as stage actors who have difficulty turning things off. The classic happiest example of it is the stage romance, the showmance, we call it. That Where they kiss each other or it's, something. It's very <laughs> common for love interests on stage to sure. develop something off stage. Sure, can imagine, just look, just look at it and you know that, that you don't get close to somebody like that except right. in a romantic setting. Right. Therefore, this is pretty sexy business. It, yeah, <laughs> it is. And just is sharing the, I don't know, scent of each other that often being yeah. that close yeah. has, a, has an effect that yeah. uh, happens all the time. You have, to, you have to know how to turn those things off unless you don't want to. Unless you don't want to. Well, unless I suppose some to. kids go into that because they would like to have the proximity. They, yeah, they would like to have a little something. <laughs> a little yeah. stage kissing. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Yeah, that's not one of the best reasons no, no, to go no, into we theater. Don't, we, don't, we don't encourage that. <laughs> we don't encourage that one. But uh, yeah, sometimes there, there, there are different um, aspects to the craft that, that can be taught. Um, there is innate ability within people. I think that there's, um, when someone is a natural, quote unquote, it's um, most often it's someone who is able to recognize um, the, the feeling behind the manifestation just naturally and also have the mental capacity, intellectual capacity 
to do their analysis and do their homework. There's a lot of work. There's a very profound and personal education involved. Do you, do you see people change in front of your eyes, you know, with these classes and plays? Do you see them when they make the, the recognition, when they realize how they can put it all together, don't they change as human beings somehow? Oh, yeah. Well, you definitely see aha moments in people where they realize, oh, I've been working so hard. And once you, once you ring the bell, you know, it can't be unrung once they realize something. Oh, that's what it is. And you also see people working so hard to get something right when all they need to do is stop working. And that's, those are kind of lessons in life that, yes, you definitely, um, not every day, but you often see that, that recognition in people. And those are the people who, whether they continue as actors or not, they will always have a profound appreciation for Sure. It. It's like going to law school. It wouldn't hurt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Help you through your life. Well, well, thank you, Donna. It's been wonderful talking about it's this with you. It's been a pleasure. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little tearful. Oh, Maybe uh, you are, too. On demand. <laughs> <laughs> it's very emotional. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was a wonderful discussion. I learned a lot. I may never be the same. <laughs> and incidentally, what time is it? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. You're hired. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. Donna. <laughs> Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Come over any time. <laughs> <Okay. laughs>